Today at the National Press Club, the head of the National Security College at the Australian National University, Professor Rory Metcalf. And Michelle Price, the CEO of AusCyber, the Australian Cyber Security Growth Network. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Press Club of Australia today's Westpac Address. My name is Tom Connell. I'm a director of the club and also a political reporter and host at Sky News. Today's guests, Rory Medcalf, head of the National Security College at the ANU, Michelle Price, chief executive of Australian Cyber Security Growth Network. Uh, the topic today, securing Australia in the 2020s. It could invoke a sense of doom in many. Uh, the, but of course we're trying to emerge at the moment from the economic hit of COVID, thankfully not a big health hit on Australia. At the end of that, running into this trade war headlong with China and also the changing climate, still a major threat to Australia, possibly going to be hit harder than most. Our speakers though, thankfully, don't see us as helpless players in all of this. Rory has certainly been outspoken on the issue of China of late, urging people also to understand the mindset of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, to be better informed about what motivates the CCP and where that ends up for Australia. And while cyber security is a term increasingly driving fear into business and government perhaps, and perhaps consumers out there as well, increased attacks that are costing our economy billions, Michelle is at the vanguard of our defence and talking up the economic opportunity of cyber defence as well. If you're following the conversation online, you can find us on Twitter, our user handle at Press Club Australia and our hashtag NPC. Everyone, please welcome Rory Medcalf. Well, thanks for that, uh, that daunting introduction and I'll try to stay a little positive. Um, look, to begin with, uh, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we're meeting today, uh, the Ngunnawal people, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As an Australian, I sometimes find it sad that um, one of this continent's finest creatures, the black swan, has been co-opted uh, quite cruelly in the language of risk analysis as a symbol of bad surprises. Now, most of you have heard that unfortunate term, black swan event. Uh, one feature of a black swan event is that it is predictable in hindsight, uh, a bit like COVID-19, you might say. But in truth, uh, there's nothing shocking about a black swan. Uh, and indeed, to Australia's first peoples, uh, these birds have always been reassuringly normal. Uh, personally, when describing strategic shock, I prefer the term black elephant. Uh, it's a black swan crossed with the elephant in the room. A problem so big, so obvious, so difficult, so normal, that the polite thing, especially for important people, is to say and do nothing about it until it's too late. You could say, if you were being a little uncharitable, that for Australia, 2020 has been a year of three rampaging black elephants. Catastrophic climate-induced bushfires, the COVID-19 pandemic, and a China that is turning economic goods into goads of coercion. All three involve risks that we could have foreseen, and maybe some of us did. And it's time to consider what other black elephants are out there. Perhaps this is to do with the low resilience of our energy future, including our reliance on imported transport fuels and our slow, politicised progress away from carbon or the often frugal resourcing of our national research and innovation base. And I, perhaps my colleague uh, Michelle Price will have things to say about innovation in a little while. Or perhaps it's a regional flashpoint finally descending into war. Whatever the future black elephants may be, the last 30 years are the fading memory of a holiday from history. We can't go back. In this new world for Australia, strategic competition between powerful nations is heightened. Indeed, China sees it in terms of struggle. That is more than competition. Confrontation and conflict are already occurring, mostly below the threshold of armed force, but war is becoming imaginable. It's no surprise that one of the key objectives of our modernising defence force is to deter. 
our interests, our values, and the way they combine to make this country sovereignty and identity, these will be under constant pressure in the years ahead from multiple directions. Earlier this year, uh, I think as was acknowledged, I, I published a book titled Contest for the Indo-Pacific on the dangerous strategic dynamics of our region. Here, Australia is not alone, as many nations must find a way between conflict, conflict or capitulation in the face of assertive Chinese power. This year's vicissitudes have prompted an acceleration of middle players, India, Japan, even our friends in Europe, seeking new ways to collaborate and respond to the challenge, a challenge that is becoming global. And the incoming American administration is promising a new premium on partnerships, particularly with democracies. This new geopolitics has changed the character of risk. It's made risk a constant shape changer. Connectivity, cyberspace and great power rivalry are collapsing the boundaries between security and economics, the domestic and the international, and even people and technology. Therefore, the vital terrain for national and international security is now what happens at home, here and right across this federated Australia. Unprecedented is not a reason to be unprepared. So wrote Air Chief Marshal Mark Binskin recently in the report of the Royal Commission into Natural Disaster Arrangements following the disastrous bushfires. His words, and many of the Royal Commission's recommendations, can apply to security more broadly. Whether we are dealing with pandemic, terrorism, supply chain disruption, foreign coercion, or worse. Our guideposts to securing Australia in the 2020s and beyond include risk, resilience and responsibility, and a sense of integrated and inclusive national policy. This means national and collaborative leadership, a frank conversation with the public about risks, rights and responsibilities, a clear, robust and accountable system, unbroken linkages across the Federation, a sense of common purpose, and all within a framework that respects our democratic institutions and the proper place of partisanship and, of course, bipartisanship. It's a big ask. Preparedness, though, is the key. Because a paradox of security is that sometimes it is necessary to accept increased risk in order to build resilience against even greater risk later on. And that is how I believe history will read much of the China trauma our diplomatic and economic relations are going through right now. Recently, I was at a meeting to discuss the question when it comes to Australia's standing in the world, how are we doing as a nation? I won't tell you the answer, it was under the Chatham House rule, but the right question is how are we preparing? To the credit of the Commonwealth Government and our national security agencies, and indeed to the opposition for its broad bipartisanship, Australia has made substantial progress in recent years in some areas. We're building or reforming many of the policy institutions, the frameworks and the capabilities we need to give Australia a decent chance in the future. Our defence force modernisation, our Indo-Pacific foreign policy, based on activism and a new web of partnerships, machinery of government changes, including home affairs and the Office of National Intelligence, new cyber capabilities, and the legislation to empower more concerted action in the national interest, including with regard to foreign interference. None of these steps have been perfect or uncontroversial, but all have been necessary as building blocks towards an Australia that can begin to approximate the sum of its parts when it engages and defends. What we need now, however, is a clear and frank articulation by government about how and why all these pieces fit together and what other preparations must be done. Therefore, it's time for a national security strategy, or perhaps more accurately, a national interest strategy. This could look at how to integrate security with other vital areas of policy related to the national interest, prosperity and social cohesion. If we are playing a long game, and I believe we must, then we need a vision for a confident, resilient, inclusive Australia that explains how it all fits together. Sustainability, energy, infrastructure, health, education, technology and innovation, on which I'm sure my colleague Michelle Price will have more to say. This national strategy should address the tensions between security and prosperity, or between security and cohesion in a multicultural society. Because if we take the long view, these goals can and should mutually reinforce. 
As my students know all too well at the National Security College, security is one of those deceptive terms that defies easy definition. It's the ultimate ambiguous symbol. It's easy to politicise. A national interest strategy will work best if it's supported, therefore, by a new national security conversation, one that recognises that the true nature of security is about confidence and inclusion rather than fear and exclusion. Security is not some absolute, but it's a state of mind that involves reducing our anxiety by actually engaging with risk. Therefore, it's about the Australian people, all of us. So much of the unfinished business in preparing Australia for the long disruption ahead requires a truly inclusive national conversation. This includes building trusted and apolitical engagement with all parts of the community, including Australians of Chinese origin. National security officials are not always the ideal people to lead that conversation. There could be scope, for instance, for an independent voice, let's call her or him, something like a sovereignty commissioner, to sustain constant consultations and outreach. Parliament, too, has a role to play in the inclusive national security story. All parliamentarians, federal and state, would, I believe, benefit from greater situational awareness about risks like foreign interference. For its part, the Commonwealth Government needs to become, or to keep becoming, in fact, more open to, to risk management in the way it shares sensitive, even classified briefings with the private sector, infrastructure provi providers, state governments and universities. And this should extend to the opposition. The risk management approach should include reviewing the way that we do security clearances for government officials. The rigidities of the current system, which dates back to the 1950s, can be obstacles to harnessing the talent of multicultural Australia or simply new generations who live and think differently. And I acknowledge there have been significant efforts to modernise the security clearance system, but I suspect it has a way to go. Our new security ethos then also needs to include all levels of government as genuine partners, and I'll conclude in a few moments on this point. States and territories have always been focused on serving their communities, and rightly so. But now, thanks to the new geopolitics, that changed nature of risk that I've spoken about, states and territories are the front line of national security. This has long been the case on terrorism and social cohesion, where the arrangements between federal security agencies and state police forces have become strong, trusted and responsive. State and territory governments have serious capabilities and can use them with great effect on issues to do with security broadly defined, like countering extremism, disaster relief, or the successful frontline response to the pandemic. Now they need to be essential players in a unified national response to contemporary risks which touch ordinary Australian lives, from economic coercion against primary producers, to cyber attacks on health providers, to propaganda campaigns, propaganda campaigns inside migrant communities, particularly in some state capitals. State and territory governments have unique relationships with those communities and information about community needs and sentiments that they can interpret to give the federal government a clearer picture about this country, its interests and its values. But state governments and territory governments can also be seen, and I suspect sometimes have been seen, by foreign powers as weak links in the preservation and protection of Australian sovereignty. Now, I know that I'm speaking from Canberra, uh, and I can be accused of being inside the famous Canberra bubble. Uh, I'm acutely aware <clears throat> that states and territories are where it gets real. Uh, more connected to the daily decisions, the welfare, the livelihoods of Australian communities than the federal government can ever be. States and territories do not deal with abstractions of diplomatic talking points or strategic analysis, but tangible day-to-day -day elements of national resilience and national vulnerability, an inclusive society, vital services like health, education and policing, critical infrastructure and indeed the nation's frontline geography, including its maritime geography. So states and territories therefore have a special responsibility to secure Australia and they need to be equipped to do so. I find it absurd that states and territory administrations, state and territory administrations generally do not have personnel with the job descriptions or security clearances to connect with the intelligence and security advice that the Australian government is able to provide. 
This means that premiers and chief ministers are not allowing themselves to get the trusted advice and information that they need. I would argue that all states and territories should set up a dedicated national security unit within their department of premier or chief minister. This would involve a small team of officials with high level security clearances, allowing them to access classified information and intelligence. They could provide key advice to the first ministers and the first secretaries, states and territories in the national cabinet and the bureaucratic arrangements that are evolving to develop and support it long term. This would allow at last for a genuine national security conversation and give states and territories a greater chance to affect national security policy. It would be a modest but powerful investment, maybe five or six officials per jurisdiction. We can talk about the details during question time if there's scope. Commonwealth agencies for their part would need to be forward leaning in their willingness to share security information with those state and territory units. And that would involve as well certain comfort levels with federal, among federal ministers, knowing that there are secrets that they know that now the state uh, and, uh, and territory leaders know as well. But this is not about telling states to accept Commonwealth security assessments at face value. Having their own objective and informed security advice would actually help states and territories maintain scrutiny, for example, on the use of the brand new federal powers to block or reverse arrangements with foreign partners to help ensure that these are used sparingly and proportionately. This is about positioning states and territories to be more active and responsible contributors to security outcomes, and it's about shaping that conversation and policy at a national level in a genuinely two-way direction. It could reduce the political mistrust it cuts both ways and I believe contribute over time to a more mature decision-making culture on all sides when it comes to the national interest. To conclude, it's important that when the government imposes positive security obligations, as it now does on corporate leaders in relation to cyber security, that there should be correspondingly sensitive briefings to explain the risks and preferably cleared personnel inside the private sector, technology and research organisations as well. And that is a perfect moment to hand over to my colleague, uh, Michelle Price. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture, including through cyberspace. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm incredibly proud that we have a growing number of First Nations people leading cybersecurity companies and, in fact, we have one in the room today in Kieran Haynes with Willie Armour. And we're showing a better way on diversity and inclusion in our cybersecurity industry as a means for other technology industries, particularly those that are emerging, to take the example and lead the way for our nation. To note uh, Rory's remarks, which are always very engaging, and national interest strategy. Now that is inspired. It is something that actually Rory and I have spoken about, I think, in, in sort of reasonably fragmented terms over the past maybe seven or eight years. So here it come together in such a cohesive way and as he's just described, I think is exactly the right timing to be having this kind of conversation. And in my time that I spent at the National Security College back in 2016-17, which I was very grateful to do after leaving government uh, for 14 years, having de uh, delivered the 2016 uh, cybersecurity strategy, which was the first strategy of its kind in the world, uh, still very proud to have had President Obama put the seal on that statement. It's not uh, my own self-interest that makes that claim. Uh, that we actually did have a lot of conversations about how we still at the time in Australia, across all levels of government, had what we say in national security, air gaps in the siloing between national security and economic prosperity. And it gives me great hope that we fast forward to today and because of the pandemic, we are having conversations now about the three elements to national interest, national security, economic prosperity and social impact, and to see them for what they are. They are the engines for the identity of this nation. And to be able to start to unpack what that means by learning the lessons of the past decade and preparing for the future several decades. 
So national security in the 2020s absolutely is exactly what Rory was describing in my view. It is taking the prepared approach of learning the lessons and positioning ourselves to stop talking about poppies, they were never indigenous to this nation, and to start talking about how we work collegiately, collaboratively, with heart and focus, there's no punching anymore, to take what is ours. And we do it with other nations. And it's great to have the UK High Commission in the room today with the partnerships that we form through cyberspace as one of the true pieces of glue that brings those air gaps closer together. We must be doing this now. And I'm going to lay out for you today some of the reasons why. Cybersecurity is something that really has burst onto the scene relative to a lot of other topics that we face as a nation. We have things like climate change bubbling along. I remember as a university student chaining myself to trees to stop trees being cut down to let the M2 be built just behind Macquarie University uh, back in the, the mid-90s. Yes, I'm showing my age there proudly of my age. Uh, but, you know, back then we were doing things about saving whales and saving trees. Now we talk about saving the planet. And it's a very short bow to be talking about climate change and cybersecurity. That's one of many examples I'm going to give you today of just how much cyberspace and cybersecurity is critical to how we do frame the conception of a national interest strategy to push Australia further ahead. Recently, we released at AusCyber the 2020 update to the Cyber Security Sector Competitiveness Plan. This is a document that we produce every year that gives a picture of what Australia's cyber industry looks like, what barriers we have to success, but exactly where we're up to right now in terms of pushing past all of our stereotypes and unexplained achievements to lay it all bare. And what I'm really proud to say with this document is that we've been able to prove that cybersecurity as an industry is not a figment of the nerd's imagination, nor is it something that a Prime Minister would get up and talk about when we think it's convenient from a diplomatic perspective. We now have $2.3 billion worth of gross value add happening from Australia's cybersecurity industry coming from $5.6 billion worth of spending going on within this economy just in the last 12 months, and that was not because of COVID, around cybersecurity products and services across the nation. Now, that might sound small in comparison to where we were, though, in 2017 when AusCyber started as an organisation to help propel the growth of Australia's cybersecurity industry, we had a roundabout, and I'm saying a roundabout because there was no census, we couldn't actually tell for certain how many sovereign cybersecurity companies we had operating in our economy. Our guesstimate was around about 65. Today, we estimate there's at least 500, and AusCyber is working directly with 359 of those companies. For that to happen in under four years, Imagine what the next three decades will look like. But we need that. We need that because the other report that we released this year, Australia's first ever digital trust report, identified, and you can look at all of the uh, sort of actuarial analysis in the back, and we did that with Synergy Group, and I know Synergy's in the room today, it showed that the economy is now engaged in over $1 trillion worth of digital activity every year. Every year, $1 trillion in Australia is happening through digital activity. Now, if we had said that before COVID, I'm reasonably confident that there would have been pitchforks, arrows, all sorts of weapons being aimed at AusCyber for making such a claim. It truly has been one of the silver linings of a situation that the planet really didn't need to have, but perhaps we knew was coming, to Rory's point about black elephants. The pandemic has proven to us 
that we have had an underlying dependency on digital activity for some time now. We haven't known really how to measure it and we certainly haven't really known how to talk about it. So when we look at the role of cybersecurity as part of our pursuits of national interest, you can start to see that it is not just something about national security. It was born out of national security, that is true. But as a country that has always been, from a consumer standpoint, an early adopter of emerging technology, and for the world um, helping to normalise emerging technologies, and gosh, hasn't Telstra helped with that? Telstra's in the room today too. We are standing in a situation now where enormous economic prosperity can come to our country as a result of being conscious around that relationship between national security, economic prosperity and social impact in a cyber physical world. Now, what do I mean by cyber physical? Many in the room would kind of be nodding their heads around thinking, yes, I know what that means. That's, that is very good. But the average Australian really does struggle with this concept. And can I say that most administrations around the world in like-minded countries struggle too. The simplest way to describe it is that every activity that we are now engaged in has a digital implication as well as a physical implication. And there might be multiple ones of them. I get challenged on all this all the time. Please challenge me. I've been able to give a digital example of every physical activity so far. I've even been asked if it means that going to the bathroom is something that is a cyber physical activity. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And you're kind of probably thinking about that. There's a couple of angles there that you could go with. <laughs> if you don't have devices implanted inside you yet, you can go there yourself. But cyberspace is something that is still heavily undervalued, not just by our nation, but by many others around the world. This is where in lies our opportunity. We have all of the ingredients now in Australia to learn the lessons of the past decade and absolutely apply those to the next set of decades as we accelerate our growth coming out of this pandemic. And if we don't take this opportunity, shame on us. Because it is there for us to take. Our spirit of collaboration is something that we are recognised for globally. Our ability to partner and muck in and solve a problem, identify the challenge and get it done, is again something that we are globally recognised for. So where are those poppies? Why do they still exist? Why is there still an element of distrust when we are on the light side of the equation, as we would argue? The amount of time that we spend warring against each other fascinates me. It is a blood sport, especially if you're in the Canberra bubble. But that energy pointed towards a national interest strategy is something that we can harness. And what I've witnessed over the past couple of years is a very, very particular set of conversations that do happen for right or wrong behind closed doors between all sides of politics in trying to wrap our heads around, at least from a political and policy point of view, how we tackle the barriers to remove those barriers and make good on these opportunities. So at the beginning, we talked a little bit about, in the introduction, it was made reference that yes, cyber security can be something that comes across as incredibly scary. And in fact, for the average Australian, whether that Australian is running their own business, of the 2.3 million small businesses that we have in Australia, or it's an individual, three years old, watch the next three-year-old that you come across, they mimic behaviour, they're the best hackers we've got, right through to those who are close to end of life and everyone in between. Whether they are engaged in business or not, they are engaged in business. Every single one of us is in the, engaged in the business of cyberspace. We need to be able to channel that and start to focus on, on what our real strengths are and cross-examine how we live our values. 
So when we focus on this issue of trust, trust in cyberspace is something that's very, very tricky. It is something that we are threading a needle on every single second. And for the cybersecurity professionals in the room, you've all got beaming smiles coming back at me right now because the people that you see and the people that we don't see protecting our nation against malicious activity in cyberspace are our true heroes. That cyber physical war that we are engaged in every single day is incredibly undervalued and unrecognised in how we go about taking a step forward into the 2020s and beyond. And part of that preparedness that Rory spoke to is about recognising just how important now cyber security is as enabler to every endeavour that we're engaged in. And the truly, truly hard work of NBN Co and Telstra to make sure that the infrastructure was available, was reliable and was trustworthy across March, April and May has not yet been recognised and I recognise that today. It was incredible. What we need to do is take those efforts and harness them and talk loudly and proudly about them. They are the examples of how we can bring together a conversation at a national level on how we trust each other <laughs> and how we do engage the public to make sure that we understand what risks we will tolerate, which ones we won't, and how, in using that spirit of collaboration and also trust, we can push back where we need to. And increasingly, colleagues, we will need to. The rate of technological convergence and how we apply technology in our everyday lives is absolutely running at a pace. So we have a bit of a dichotomy here, and I'll wrap up on this note. The pace of change, we're all feeling it. And in fact, I would say that the plastic surgeons out there are really going to benefit, particularly from my generation, <laughs> as we show, we show the scars of how quick life now moves. That's even before we've added kids and family and all of those things into it. You all just felt tired, didn't you? <laughs> but we need to be patient. We need to also be patient to understand what the implications of the intersection between technology and humans truly is. And I would argue that as this conception of a national interest strategy gets legs, because of course, Rory, we're going to make sure it does, the training of our future workforce is not future, it is now. We need to make sure that everyone does appreciate and feel the value of having cyber skills in every single job in the economy in every single classroom in the country. And more so that as people do run through the different courses of their career, that we continue to work together in a focused way to develop judgment. As I go around the world, I can see that there is little effort going on in most countries around developing judgment in our workforces and our communities. How do you judge whether or not a foreign actor is seeking to interfere with your way of life, either directly to impact you or to impact the company that you work for, the government agency that you work for, or with your finances or with your family? How do we develop the judgment to know that the convergence of artificial intelligence with quantum in robotics within the next seven years is the right thing to do from an ethical and prosperity perspective? How do we develop the judgment to make sure that we truly value and embed a sense of secure and privacy by design for everything that we do? Because colleagues, if we get this right, I am the optimist. Most who know me know that I am. If we get this right, we will be one of the world's greatest leaders in how to be human. I would like you to let that just sink in for a moment. And the reason why I'm asking you to do that is because we focus so much on the technology. We need to remember that cyberspace is a domain of human interaction that we built ourselves. It is the only domain of human engagement that is 100% 
human constructed. So if it's the enabler, if it's the vector, if it's the source of new jobs, new knowledge, new activity, new creativity, new innovation, and new ways of life, then absolutely these are the things that we need to be focusing on. So my very, very last point is that I am grateful, I am truly grateful that this country has, over time, invested in institutions like the National Security College at the ANU that really is globally unique in how we take the leadership of national security seriously, can have open and frank conversations about these really, really deep and serious issues that are facing our communities, to pull them apart, put them back together again and put frank and fearless uh, advice to government and not just understand the impacts for government but for industry, for the rest of academia, for the community and to sharpen that judgement. Thank you very much. Rory, I might start with you. I did enjoy um, this uh, sort of if you like, branching out of the security unit within the state, but being a journalist, I'm going to go to potential problems with it, of course, because uh, you didn't mention National Cabinet. It started off perhaps with quite a lot of cooperation, but we have seen that fracture somewhat, and even an issue of internal borders is blowing that up somewhat. Do you see the biggest impediment to that being the federal government really welcoming states, including Labor states, into an area they love to have control of and like to boast about in terms of achievement and being sort of part of their DNA. Is that the biggest impediment to that going ahead, do you think? Look, I mean, there's so many ways we could unpack that. And I did have a little model about cost sharing and things that I don't want to... I can go into if I have to, but look, the really important point here is that um, it, it's certainly too early to say, um, to, to cast any sort of negative judgement on National Cabinet. I mean, I think it got off to a really important and necessary start. Of course, there's politics in it. Uh, I still think it has uh, a serious future, and I think part of the evidence of that is that there does appear to be already bureaucratic structures developing behind it. And you know what bureaucracy is like. Once you get started, you just can't stop. But seriously, I think you know objective officials within at, at all levels of government, I think, do have ways of engaging and talking to one another that will support that process. I actually would. I, I get the sense that there is an appetite in the Commonwealth to share more with the states. I think there probably is a conversation to be had uh, about the level of investment required and just crossing that threshold that states uh, are somehow going to see some of that very sensitive information and there may well be security folks in the room who think that's just not going to happen. I think, I think it can, I think it will. Um, and in fact, I, I, I think there are other complications which I'm not going to share with you because I'm going to wait for you to give them to me that uh, are more concerning. But it's a small investment. Yeah, if states can afford trade commissioners overseas, they can afford half a dozen officials. Well, I mean, one interesting example might be the, the Belt and Road Initiative deal Victoria has done with China. We know yeah. we've got the federal government, you know, sort of carping at the sidelines without enunciating exactly what the issue is. Um, is that something that with those sort of, you know, shared trust, we might have seen them on the same page about that? Well, I'd hope so. I mean, I think, uh, you know, again, not casting too much judgment on individual state governments and individual decisions. Uh, I had a list that was too long for the speech. Um, it would be nice to think that whether it's uh, in Melbourne, whether it's Victoria or whether it's Northern Territory or whoever it might be, when a future opportunity arises, you have uh, some well-chosen, objective, security-cleared individuals who, who are there to offer objective advice who maybe almost ring the first alarm bells uh, and they ring those alarm bells uh, in a non-partisan way to their Premier and they're there, by, they're, they're there to support their Premier as they engage with the Commonwealth. Uh, I think we're talking about small numbers of people who would have to be chosen for very high levels of uh, integrity. Michelle, you did make me wince somewhat when you said cyber skills because I thought of my own. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm alone in you sort of come to the age of early 20s and you're up to date with everything and that's sort of where your skills stop. That's as up to date you remain for the rest of your life, yeah. whether it was a typewriter or Microsoft Word or whatever it might be. <laughs> so what's the solution to that? I mean, um, people are busy, as you say. Uh, is it up to um, you know, employers to upgrade cyber skills and perhaps there's a payoff, they don't get hacked by someone you know, clicking on the dodgy link and it helps everybody. H how do you see them improving for people beyond those early years? 
Such a good question. Uh, so to be succinct, I think that uh, we need to take a layered approach, uh, frankly. So we've got, we've got quite a bit of activity happening across the economy now around cyber skilling. Uh, it's siloed though. So I go back to my very, very sort of early remarks in my, um, in my speech that they, those air gaps in the siloing that we have a tendency to do in this country, country are absolutely leveraged by malicious activity and malicious actors. Uh, we need to make, we need to kind of get in there and sort of really look at it. I was talking to someone recently about how we, uh, you know, the success and the jarring success of things like, uh, you know, you might be a little bit too young to remember this one, Tom, but, <laughs> uh, you know, the Grim Reaper with the AIDS campaign. Now, everyone's nodding, right? Most of them, there's a couple of people that are a bit too young to remember it, but it had absolute cut through. And we can still remember what it felt like when you first saw that. And parents were being compelled to talk to their children and their um, older family members about what that was all about and um, how that was normalised within the community over a comparatively short period of time. Now, the reason why that worked was because it wasn't just a TV ad. And it wasn't just a TV ad that ran for 12 months. It was a whole series of activities that were coordinated across all levels of the community and society to be able to keep that uplift. So when we come to cyber security, I would suggest that we need to look at the types of personalities that we all have. It's really hard, but I'm going to kind of, you know, undress for a moment. I mean, that's what it is to do these days. You're taking the device off. What does this do to engage you? You can see I've got security on it straight away. This is a form of gamification. This is adult gamification. You are engaged in exactly the same kind of um, brain synapse kind of behaviour that kids are when they pick up an iPhone or an iPad or anything like that. I have a, a sort of a particular predilection for the eyes, but like, really good security. Uh, but it is through getting to the heartstrings to change the head. And we can continuously do that through incentives. We aren't doing it through incentive structures at the moment. We're doing moment in time training and we're doing moment in time education. When we look at the uplift, um, right now over 190,000 students in high schools across Australia have now done four cybersecurity challenges from year nine to year 12. That should be every high school student, but they're doing it across a period of two years. So if you're an employer in the room, awesome. You've just won. But we need to be doing that at all ages, across all languages, all, all, all ethnic groups within our communities. Uh, it needs to reach everyone. Gamification, perhaps that gives me an excuse to start up video games again, <laughs> so that's encouraging. Let's go to some questions, uh, beginning with Andrew Tillett. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review. Um, thanks for that, Tom. Michelle, we, had, we saw um, Dave Sharma, the government backbencher, release a, report, a paper he'd written for China Matters yesterday, and one of the things Dave said was that we should be prepared to call out China when it engages in um, large-scale cyber attacks. It's something that you know, the government has been reluctant to do publicly, but we all sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, know who it is. Um, do you think we're at the point where we should start to call out China for cyber attacks? And um, in particular, given that the sort of the, 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 the current rock bottom state of the relationship, is there anything to gain by not calling them out? And I'd like to hear from Rory on that as well, thanks to you. After you, Michelle. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I was actually, I'm surprised that I was the first one to get the China question. Um, so I think that what's really important uh, to use this platform to explain is that it's not just China. And the, the kinds of nuances and sophistication that is required to be able to identify the who of a malicious cyber attack is incredibly detailed. And if you get it wrong, lives literally can be lost. This is the cyber physical impacts of these kinds of things. Uh, it's not just China. And so, yes, there might be kind of the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And yes, there are kind of uh, markers, there are signals, there are things in code that you can see of patterns of behaviour where you can think that you've got it nailed on who it is, uh, but they all mimic each other. And there's some very, very, very sophisticated actor competition out there uh, that, you know, there's a couple of countries that show up China on occasion. So we do have to be really careful about how we go about doing this. And it's also looking at it from, through that lens of national interest. So if we were to be 99% sure, because we can't ever be 100% sure, if it was 99% sure that it was China, for example, in any given situation, 
uh, and we declared that it was China and uh, we made a statement about it and then it turned out to be wrong, it's likely that we didn't take into account what the impacts would be for the lower or upper levels in the value chains to national security, to economic prosperity, and increasingly importantly, from a social cohesion perspective. Uh, we are sitting in a geographic position, and here's the segue across to Rory, we're in a geographic position where we need to start recognising the nuance of this. So to directly answer your question, I think we're still a, a ways away from being able to confidently say it was China and be in a position where we could wear the consequences of that without it affecting everyday Australians. Yeah, I'd look, two points I'd make um, in addition to that or slightly uh, on a slightly different tangent. Firstly, you know, when we, uh, when we see the list of grievances that the Chinese Embassy shared, I think with, um, with uh, some friends in the fourth estate here, you know, the list of grievances against Australia, uh, it would be an even longer list of grievances if in fact the government was as forthright on attribution uh, of cyber attacks as it probably could be. And, you know, maybe it's the 95, 99%, maybe it's, maybe it's pretty close to 100 sometimes. But the fact is the government, Australian governments for the past five or more years have actually been incredibly restrained mm -hmm. when it comes to publicly attributing cyber attacks from anyone, including China, uh, which is why, I mean, if you read the last two China uh, cyber security strategies, and I defy you to find the word China in either of them. So in that sense, uh, you know, we, there is more caution, I think, perhaps than is publicly or internationally recognised. Where um, there is a bit more forthrightness is when occasionally we've called out um, malicious cyber activity in company. And so I think increasingly you will see groupings of countries, not just the Five Eyes, but also uh, others. And I think two years ago, Five Eyes and uh, European partners in particular, I think Japan as well, made a very direct attribution that did go back to China in that case, called it out very credibly, very publicly, I think we will see that become the occasional um, targeted approach. I think otherwise uh, the, the right balance is being struck at the moment. I'd just like to add to that too, that I think that, um, you know, uh, proudly I was invited to speak at the United Nations a couple of years ago to talk about the role of a strong sovereign cyber security industry as a form of deterrence. Because when we look at the differences between our ways of life, and not just between Australia and China, but Australia and many other countries, including West, other Western countries, having a strong, sovereign, vibrant cybersecurity industry that does engage through supply chains and value chains with multinationals as well, it's hard to beat that. Next question from David Crow. Thank you, Tom. Thank you both for your remarks. David Crow from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and a director of the Press Club. Uh, I have a follow-on question to Andrew about, um, about these cyber threats. The last time we saw a major, I guess, alarm about it was when Scott Morrison called a press conference in Canberra. This was in June. Uh, I remember that day just going down at, I think, 9 o'clock in the morning. I had no idea what the press conference was going to be about, and it was a, a major alert about cyber threats. Now, when I wrote that story with my colleague Anthony Galloway, who's here, um, we... I found it quite remarkable. There was a lot of pushback. There was a lot of denial. There was a lot of criticism of Scott Morrison for overhyping the threat. Uh, there was a sense, I think, of um, uh, chicken little in that, in that scenario. So I'd, what I'm very interested in uh, from you is what is the scale of the threat? Um, uh, do we have enough transparency about where these attacks are coming from? Would more transparency help? Uh, and did you see any consequence from Scott Morrison's actions in June? Did it actually change any behaviour in preparing us or defending Australia against these threats? I'm going to go to you first on that as well. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I think the, the first part of your question, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, there is no denying it. Australia is a target. We have been for some time uh, and it's increasing. There's lots to attack. Our way of life is the envy of the world, uh, even more so now with the pandemic, with us coming through it, not just in terms of a health situation, pretty okay. Absolutely, we are sorry for the lives that have been lost. 
but compared to the rest of the world, gosh, we've, we've done okay. Um, but also economically, comparatively, as much as, of course, um, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, of course, talks to the fact that we've got a path that is quite lumpy, that's actually because of more external factors than internal. Uh, so there's lots that people want to come after. Uh, so it will continue to uh, escalate, it will continue to increase, and the severity, unfortunately, will continue to increase as well as the broader scope of the economy catches up to a baseline level of maturity around cyber security. Uh, so I think that um, to the point of the Prime Minister's statement, those who are, un are in the spheres of cyber security and understand its depth and breadth were the ones that were talking about the chicken little. As soon as you step outside of those concentric circles that overlap a lot, uh, it actually made a lot of households and a lot of small businesses sit up and think, hang on a sec, if the Prime Minister's talking about this and talking about it at a time when most of the news is about the pandemic, there must be something to this. So the impact that we've seen at OSCYBER and also with our colleagues across the country in chambers of commerce uh, and in industry associations is that it actually has created an increased amount of interest, particularly from small business, but also from particular sectors. Uh, aged care has been one, for example, where there's been a lot of questions coming around, well, goodness, we need to do something about this, where do we start? which is a fantastic situation to be in. It might not have been packaged in the best way uh, to be accessible to the average business owner or business worker, um, but you know, we're, we're taking steps forward. Uh, so when we look at the increasing level of sophistication, uh, the increasing frequency of community level conversations also needs to keep increasing. So I, I do think that the Prime Minister did the right thing. Uh, we needed to probably just back it up by a couple of other perspectives that made it uh, feel more about the what's in it for me. Just to add very briefly, I think that when we talk about being cautious about public attribution, it's quite a different story when it comes to the behind the scenes private briefings that should be going on and I think in some cases are going on with corporates, with universities for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, about their own exposure and about perhaps uh, intrusions that have, that have taken place. I think that what would also help enormously there is continuing down the track that the new uh, leadership of ASIO and ASD have taken on, which is a commitment to more uh, openness, more transparency. You've all seen, I think, well, maybe if you haven't, I suggest you check the ASIO uh, advertisement about LinkedIn, uh, think before you link, uh, about uh, recruitment uh, by foreign intelligence services. Uh, and that's out there on, on the internet. So that's the ethos that we're now seeing. We need more of that with corporates and frankly a bit more um, career mobility between government and corporates would ensure there are cleared people in corporations uh, who can um, understand, if you like, the security implications, the full implications of what they're being told. Just briefly, Michelle, I know we get a lot of headlines about you know, denial of service attacks on big Australian organisations, banks and so on, but small business, is that increasingly the, the really weak target here? We're hearing about interceptions of uh, invoices, for example. A $60,000 invoice can ruin one business. Is, is that an increasing concern? Absolutely. There's no two ways about that. And, uh, you know, again, I was asked just yesterday whether or not fraud is the number one concern that uh, businesses should be focused on. Uh, fraud is a form of the, how the threat manifests. Uh, but actually, right now, the, the, the most significant uh, threat that is facing small business is ransomware attacks. So where data is held to ransom. Uh, and this is happening all over the place because it can. The protections are so low. But what I would say, unfortunately, is that it's not just small business. You go to every sector within the economy bar two and the overall protections within the average business, regardless of size, is actually very low. So when we see these sort of, um, you know, the, the credential stuffing that's going on, um, I am not going to explain what that is because I want you to Google it. I want you to start learning these phrases. They are things that, you know, become, should become table talk. Uh, you know, and also the changes, the manipulation of invoicing details, all of that kind of thing. Very straightforward to do in this country right now by malicious actors, both here and from overseas. Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross from Canberra IQ. I just want to up the ante a bit. Coming off uh, uh, your uh, opening remarks, Professor Metcalf, you, you, uh, of all the people I've seen talk here, you, you uh, foresaw you, uh, 
more strongly the prospect of armed conflict in the, in, in the near future. Um, so my question uh, is around the idea of what, what uh, chance do you, th do you think that uh, Xi Jinping plans to um, uh, finish his reign without incorporating Taiwan into Greater China? And if that chance is about 100%, uh, what pathways would be possible? So I'm not going to offer you a percentage. Uh, and I think there are plenty of people who make their living trying to calculate these things inside various security agencies around the world. Look, I would argue that the greater concern, and let's go to the Taiwan example, there are several other flashpoints and expanding range of flashpoints in the Indo-Pacific that I think we need to think about. Um, but the greater concern is that, um, that increased pressure and coercion. Uh, if you like, uh, you know, we, we, ha we have a taste of it as in Australia, but of course it's nothing. Uh, it's nothing alongside what uh, Taiwan experiences where there's that military dimension as well. And it's really a combination of uh, interference. It's a threat to a key regional economy. Uh, it's uh, a threat, obviously, to democratic values and a, and a way of life. And it's experimenting with thresholds of escalation to conflict. I'm, I'm actually of the view that you know, the, uh, the full-scale uh, invasion of Taiwan is still something that is considered too risky. I could be optimistic on that. But that doesn't mean that the region couldn't slip into armed confrontation or even war uh, over Taiwan or over any of those other, um, uh, other flashpoints. And I'll just conclude on that point about the Chinese leadership or system, um, I do think one of the structural risks we face in the region is that you have a system where authoritarian control, intensifying control, is tied with assertive nationalism. And so, in a sense, the old myth that China needs a stable region for its internal development uh, no longer fully holds true. And that's why I think we should be concerned. Mark Kenny. Sorry about my tardiness there. Uh, Mark Kenny from A News Democracy Sausage, also uh, director of the Press Club. Uh, thank you both for your address today. Um, I want to ask you about uh, the issue of women in security. I notice, and this is no reflection on the club because people choose to come here, journalists choose to come here, but of the 10 people on this list that I have in front of me uh, of questioners, of which I am one, all of them are men. Um, this is a, a, a problem in the security sphere. Whenever we talk about security, we're talking very often about a subject that is mostly populated by men, Michelle notwithstanding, and I appreciate uh, your participation in this, to, in this today. And indeed, Francis Adamson, the head of DFAT, is here. There are very many prominent women around, of course, uh, in this space. But I wonder if you could just comment on whether that is a problem. I'm not specifically talking about the digital sphere here, but broadly the conception of security. If we think about some of the examples you mentioned, Rory, um, uh, in, in relation to the, you know, the big threats that we're dealing with, China, if we think about the, uh, the SAS problems in Afghanistan, all of these problems can be sheeted back to uh, an, an excess of machismo, of male culture. If there were more women involved, I can't imagine we'd have the sorts of belligerence that we see. So I wonder if I could ask you to address that. Well, listen to the room on that. That's amazing. <laughs> um, well, I'm very, very happy to make a comment on it. I think that um, absolutely, it's all in the stats. What I would say, though, is that you know it, the, the participation of any minority in complex, challenging, and I'm talking about emotionally challenging issues. My time in the Commonwealth uh, was really challenging at times. I worked for five Prime Ministers, four people. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's, everyone goes, what, what was that? What, what? Uh, Kevin had two goes. Uh, so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there were times in being an, a senior person within national security where not only are you challenged emotionally, being a woman in those circumstances, is held against you. There is a cultural dynamic here that doesn't match what we hold true to our values in broader society. It's a very, very strange thing to kind of put your finger on because it's not just one thing. And so what I would say, though, is that there have been huge amounts of effort, concerted, focused effort, put into changing that. Uh, and so if I take cybersecurity as one example, but it's actually replicated across all of the different disciplines in the security field, 
Uh, as little as five years ago, there were 4% female participation in the cybersecurity industry in Australia. We're now at 29% and we're estimating with the graduates that will come out over the next couple of years that we'll get a pretty, we're going to get pretty close to 40% within the next five years. That is happening across the board, but whether or not we can retain women within these fields is a completely different thing. And it comes back to culture. So it's being transparent, open and honest about what is tough in this space and doing exactly all of the things that is going through your minds right now that I know Francis has been a massive champion on. Do not walk past the behaviour that you will not tolerate. I have, and I say that, in, you know, like sort of like this. I have been a staunch believer in that and I do that at Cyber proudly to make it easier for other people to do it because we have to show what good looks like. Yeah, look, uh, it, it, that's a, a, a tough one to follow, I'd say. And I would actually note that it's, with your opening question that uh, I think one of the women facing the most difficult security challenges in the world today is the president of Taiwan. So there are women in security out there. Uh, it's just that uh, we're seeing, and I think we're seeing in a very positive way, uh, s significant change in this country. And we're not there yet. We've got a long way to go. Um, and I think... Michelle, you'd, uh, Michelle and other colleagues at the National Security College would know that we, um, or former colleagues, I should say, we, uh, uh, you can come back any time you want. <laughs> um, we have um, annual conferences on women in national security. We've introduced courses very much focused on women in national security in our new degree next year. There'll be a dedicated course on women and security. But certainly in the cohorts that I see of the, the future leadership of all the national security agencies and agencies more broadly defined, uh, that point you made about judgment, uh, I'm not going to make a judgment here, but it is at least, uh, if not more, well reflected in um, the women that are coming up through the ranks. Uh, so I think it really is partly about creating that space, uh, not accepting, for example, the whole mantel thing anymore. I have a hundred uh, names on my wall of um, top female cyber experts in the world, so I have absolutely no excuse uh, when I'm putting together a conference uh, not to uh, invite, in, invite them on board. You know, I think we are making progress, but you know, watch, watch this space. It's certainly far from over, and if the country's going to harness the diverse talent, not just uh, among many communities, but in terms of gender, uh, we've got to do better. I'm very conscious of time. Just as briefly as you can, is there an example of the behaviour, perhaps not without, without using names, that you've called out? Wow. Uh, well, I, I think that, um, you know, this is, this is stuff that lots of others have spoken to. Uh, you know, it, it is as subtle as uh, using uh, circumstances of, of a social nature, because Australians are quite social um, compared to a lot of other societies that are in our region, uh, where you are in a situation where you have to comply uh, with a particular form of behaviour that makes you feel very uncomfortable. Uh, and that is rife. That is absolutely rife. And for some women, uh, it's, their culture does not allow them to be able to be in those circumstances. So to even be in the room can be challenging for some cultures. And so we need to make sure that we do have all of those mechanisms available to us, including male champions of change, to be able to make sure that that gets called out. Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Thanks for your presentations. Uh, Rory, you mentioned what you described as the China trauma that Australia is currently experiencing and that it might be looked at in the future as part of Australia building its resilience. When we see the day-to-day -day developments, it might not feel like building resilience. So can you just explain what you mean by that? And in, to, in, in, in building up Australia's resilience, um, have there been any own goals or unforced errors in your view? Ooh. OK, I'll start with the... Do you want to answer this? No, that's all yours. I'll start, I'll start with the second one. Look, um, you know, everyone is a pundit and a commentator on this issue this year. We've all got our own opinions on whether a minister or a prime minister or an official could have chosen this word or that word slightly differently in a different situation. I do have a strong view that structurally, um, if it wasn't going to happen this year, it was going to happen. Um, and that goes to the, uh, the nature of the system, the way that the current leadership of China has actually changed that system. China has changed profoundly in the last 10 years or 15 years ago when I would have been considered um, a, a dove and a China engager. Uh, I still don't like the term hawk. But China has changed and I think it was going to, this, was, this, this contradiction was going to affect us sooner or later. That's not 
nice news to all of the, um, the producers and all those in our economy who are being deeply affected by this, uh, but I think it's the reality. I also think that the uh, that any transition to diversi diversification is going to take time. It took time in the 70s when, uh, when, when, when Britain suddenly let us down um, in very different circumstances. It will take time, it won't be perfect, but if we're going to build this generational plan that I think uh, Michelle and I are talking about, uh, then we've really got to start now in any case. I mean, if we, if we expect in 2050 the Australian economy to look exactly the same as it does now, then we should simply be focusing on a reset at all costs, but we will lose our national identity in the process, uh, and I you know, defy any government to make that choice. Yeah. Next question comes from Anthony Galloway. Uh, Anthony Galloway from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Um, Michelle, you spoke about silos in our cyber defences. I was wondering if I could ask both of you, what structural changes would you like to see within the federal government to make sure we don't have silos? So we have ASD, which is you know, primarily a foreign intelligence agency, and you've seen the sensitivities that happen when it just tries to lend its capabilities to the AFP, for example. Um, in this age where cyber attacks from state-based actors aren't just about stealing state, state secrets, but it's, it's industrial level. Should ASD eventually come under Home Affairs, for example? Uh, if not, kind of what, what, what stru structural changes would you like to see? Wow. First. There's an assumption built into that question. There is. <laughs> Uh, there is. Uh, so one of the things that I was not successful in doing as part of the 2016 cyber security strategy, now that it's no longer our current strategy, I can speak openly about it, uh, was actually convincing uh, Malcolm that, uh, you know, it was one of the very few things I couldn't convince him on, uh, was that uh, like other nations, we needed to recognise just how important cyber security is to every endeavour and that to lead effectively on cyber security, we need to lead from the centre. And I mean that in all of the different conceptions that that can take. Uh, and so I think from a kind of structural point of view, to look at it at a global level in the sense of the global economy, uh, those silos are because in Australia we obviously are very wedded to that 1950s conception of what are our sectors in the economy. And so we look at it in these verticals, we don't look at the horizontals. And increasingly, the activity that is happening within the economy is at the horizontal level. And the engagement between sectors is happening in a horizontal kind of way. And so the value chains that are getting, get being created out of that means that increasingly there will be pressure applied to the same siloing that happens within the constructs of government. So if I was to say that there needs to be some kind of a change, I think that ASD benefits from being in the defence portfolio. I wouldn't put it in the Home Affairs portfolio myself uh, because I think it uh, ignores the point of why ASD exists in the first place and how it works with its, um, its counterparts in the Five Eyes and elsewhere. But I do think it could be placed in the centre. Uh, and, and that's actually what I have put forward many times. A um, couple of things. I mean, firstly, I think that for the most part, the Commonwealth bureaucracy is in, a much, is in a much less siloed, more integrated space than it was even three, four, five years ago. Uh, it's not finished, but a lot of the hard work has actually been done. I'm more interested in, and this goes to a bit of, you know, inside the Canberra bubble stuff about the, uh, the, the, the structures, the techniques, you know, the use of interdepartmental committees, for example, to address issues when, frankly, um, dynamic task forces, standing task forces can address them better, and we're moving more and more to that model already. Um, I would say that uh, there is still a space for greater integration of economic and security policy, and that's one of the reasons why I think this idea of a national interest framework that, you know, heresy from the head of the National Security College, but that does, does not put security first and covering everything, but integrates security, prosperity and cohesion, that's going to be the way to go. I think the real heavy lifting are the things I've spoken about today, states and territories, bipartisanship, private sector, civil society. Plenty of ideas for those yeah. listening to uh, take to up, do. including some in the room. We'll see what happens. But let's conclude on that note. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Rory Medcalf and Michelle Price. Thank you.